Good morning, all. Welcome to worship today. It's shaping up to be a beautiful day. I'm looking forward to it. It seems like we alternate between winter and spring. We've been doing that. I'm not sure when it's going to toggle, <laughs> finally. Um, Tuesday, February the 27th, coming right up, 9.30 a.m., the UMW is having uh, their meeting, and that's a pledge service. Wednesday, um, hopefully weather will allow this week. We'll finally have a <laughs> Bible fellowship. We'll get that series started on who is this man. That's actually quite a good series. Coming up Sunday, March uh, 4th, uh, next week, it's going to be Communion Sunday. And a little further on down the line, Thursday, March 8th, that's going to be the acrylic pour. And I need to know if you're going to go. Okay, and you need to know. Do you have me down as one? Yes, I do. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that sounds really neat. I'm excited about it. I always liked finger painting, but it just seemed inappropriate after age 10. And so whenever there's anything that's even in that ballpark, liquid pour paint, I like the sound of it. Anything that's a potential mess that I wouldn't have been allowed to do, give me a chance to do it, I'm all in. And then that Saturday, March 10th, 9.30 uh, a.m., Rita Wynn, the, our guest speaker also on that Sunday, is going to make a presentation on the missionary conferences of the United Methodist Church. So, okay. And there's going to be a meal, and you need to know in advance. Okay, so RSVP for that. In other words, let you know, right, Hazel? Yep. Just let you know, and that'll do it. Now, remember, that's also going to be the Saturday before daylight savings time. Um, I think I've already admitted that the, my alarm clock is, I don't have to do anything to it. I never wanted to set it back, to pushing too many buttons. I just let my phone do itself. But if you do need to reset the clock that wakes you up, you need to remember to move it forward, or you'll be an hour late everywhere on Sunday. And then that is also going to be UMW Sunday, um, and Rita Wynn will have some more words for us uh, that day. And that's also our UMCOR Sunday, a special offering where we take up the money that's used to cover the administrative expense, expenses for all of UMCOR's assistance projects so that all money donated to those specific projects, 100% of it, can go to providing actual assistance. And that Sunday will also be at 1145. Uh, regular church board business meeting. Palm Sunday this year is going to be on March 25th, and Easter Sunday is going to be on April 1st. I heard rumors that if you have an iPhone, it might not actually show Easter, that some of the updates removed it. I don't know if they're still working on it or what. Uh, this iPad has it on it. My phone didn't. I don't know what's going on, but it's April 1st. <laughs> And then just uh, shortly after that, uh, the following, it's going to be the following Monday, we're going to have the Writers for World Health coming, uh, coming through. There's going to be about 8 to 12 of them. We're going to be providing hospitality for them. And just if you want to come by and say hello or help greet them, uh, certainly that would be great. Again, I want to welcome you all to worship uh, this Sunday, and I encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds to worship God as we hear the prelude together. <laughs>
Good morning. Our opening hymn is not what is printed in the bulletin. We changed our mind. It will be This Is The Day, page 657 in your red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing through it one time. you to join me in our opening prayer. God of your goodness, give me yourself, for you are sufficient for me. I cannot properly ask anything less to be worthy of you. If I were to ask less, I should always be in want. In you alone do I have all. Our first hymn of praise is My Hope is Built, page 368 in your red hymnal. We'll sing all four verses.
this morning I ask if any of you have any joys or concerns that you'd like to share so that we could take them to God together in prayer. The sun is out, which isn't depressing today because it's actually a little wet as well. Any other joys or concerns this morning? joys or concerns this morning. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. God Almighty, above all, creator of all things, we thank you this morning that you are the God who is not just above us, but in our midst. We thank you today, um, especially for the the life of Billy Graham, and all the work he did to remind people that the kingdom of God is near at hand for those with eyes to see and ears to hear who are willing to take hold of it and to live into it by grace and with the assistance of your spirit. We thank you that we here today are able to know that spirit and to praise and worship you in it. We give you uh, thanks for all the ways that you um, guide us in our lives. And we're thankful this morning uh, that Lee has a contract on a new house. We ask that you would uh, make this a smooth time of transition for her as she moves in and for those who are moving out. With Billy Graham, there is a sort of moving out of a generation and when we think of the nation and see it today, we wonder what could be moving in and where it might be headed and what this next generation will believe and whom they will follow. 
We ask that you would give us peace on that matter, trusting in your ever-present spirit, but also give us a readiness to hear where you might be calling us to step into the breach that has been left by his passing. You are our most faithful and loving God. We thank you that by the power at work in us, you are able to accomplish more than we could ask or imagine. We give you thanks that by your spirit, you enable and encourage us to bear with one another in love, maintaining unity in the bond of peace, and so presenting a powerful witness to others. We give you thanks that you call to us through your grace and mercy, that you help us in our doubts, that you empower us to be your people and to be your church. Now we ask that we as your people may lead a life worthy of the calling to which we've been called, believing that there is one body and one spirit one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and it is in his name that we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is Where He Leads Me. It's page 338 in your red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all four verses.
If you'll join me for the prayer of illumination, it's found in your uh, bulletin. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The epistle reading is Romans 4, 13, and then 18 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall be your descendants. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distress made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, now the words it was reckoned to him were written, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The Gospel reading is Mark 8, 27 through 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on defined things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become in my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If you'll bow with me for a minute, I'd like to say a prayer for Jared. Heavenly Father, I lift Jared up to you this morning. Be with him as he speaks your word to us. Keep us focused, dear Lord, on you and the words that you have to say to us through Jared. I ask this in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Thinking of that passage in Romans, that the promise that Abraham would inherit the world, it made me think about just the journey of life in general. How there was a, a years and years where I seemed to be in various forms of conflict with the people in charge, to the sudden day that that almost nauseating realization that I was now the people in charge. How did that happen? 
The question of who am I, you know, what's my place in the world, that's what Abraham was looking for. That's what Peter thought he had. He had such a clear picture of it that he decided to rebuke Jesus when Jesus started telling him well, how things were going to go. He, no, 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 that doesn't fit. Not my plan, not my vision of, of who I am. That question, who am I, it's, it's a question everyone's got to ask themselves. In the broadest sense, it, it, it encompasses all the big questions. Origin, where do I come from? Meaning, what's my life about? Morality, how do I go about living? Destiny, where am I ultimately headed? And a lot of the times, we get those answers around us in ways that we don't even notice. There's always a general voice out there that is trying to tell us who we are. When we're first born, it comes to us just in the form of mom and dad. That's our whole world. And maybe a few troublesome brothers and sisters. As we go off to school, we somehow realize that every family isn't exactly like ours. And we have this sort of other identity, this who we are at home, and then this who we are at school. We begin to encounter what we call peer pressure, where our friends begin to try to tell us who we are. We want to listen to the same music. We want to like the same things, play the same games. We want to belong. So we have the family, and then we have friends. And then the tidal wave hits us. It used to be around 13 or 14 now. Who can say? When we start wondering, who are they in a relationship with? That's actually one of the first things that people will change on Facebook. They may not tell you where they went to school, where they live, where they work, but that status, single, in a relationship. Ultimately, I think that tends to become the defining relationship, even though there's still all those other relationships with mom and dad, with their family, with their friends, that defining relationship as they go forward in life. But there's other voices out there, increasingly now, that think what you do is who you are. Do you have a job that matters? I know my own brother has labored under that uh, that question, I myself labored under it. And I didn't realize there was just a set of voices out there that were trying to tell me, unless you're participating in what civilization values in an important and a unique way, and you're making a lot of money, you're not really anyone worth noticing. Who am I? People are having more and more trouble than ever ask, answering that question, young and old alike. Here's an interesting statistic. In 1985, the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA began asking their incoming college students if they felt overwhelmed with all they had to do. In 1985, 18% said they did. By 2010, it had increased to 29%. In 2016, it surged to 41%. Felt as though they were just overwhelmed with all they had to do. Hospital admissions for suicidal teens have doubled in the last decade. And the National Institute of Health says that about a third of youth and adults alike suffer from some kind of anxiety, a sense of unsettledness in the world. And for many young people, according to an article in the New York Times Magazine from October of last year, the biggest stress and their greatest anxiety is that they never get to the point where they can say, I've done enough and now I can stop. There's always one more activity, one more AP class, one more accomplishment that they can do to make sure they get into a good college and they get into a career. They become a worthy and a useful and a big fat cog in the machinery of society. They just have a constant sense that they're not measuring up. A well-meaning response that's become popular in recent years is to be, well, you don't have to measure up. You matter just because of who you are. Don't worry about what you do. Just worry about, or don't worry about it, because you matter just because you're you. But depression is on the rise. The bottom is falling out of self-esteem. That statement isn't working. People aren't content just being themselves. There's a new phenomenon that's been termed Snapchat dysmorphia. I don't know if any of you use Snapchat. I don't. But one of the things that you can do is when you post pictures of yourself, you can put it through a filter. 
It can make your nose smaller, your eyes a little larger. It subtly alters the facial features. And people grow so accustomed to seeing those portraits of themselves on Snapchat, they are now going to plastic surgeons to see if they can have their face altered to match that social filter. The idea that you're okay just being you won't go away. There's still, how am I perceived? How are others seeing me? That looks better than what I see in the mirror every day. And social media itself is becoming a graver and graver problem. One college student gave the opinion that he says his peers don't seem to realize exactly how destructive this can be. Sure, it's a useful help, but he's constantly worried about what people are seeing and thinking about him. They're looking on social media and seeing parties that they haven't been invited to. They're seeing people doing things that they themselves don't do. And then in high school, he could recall constantly judging his self-worth by his presence on Facebook, thinking, you know, nobody really wants to see me on their Facebook feed. If you don't use Facebook, whenever you go in, there's a news feed. Everyone you're friends with, the posts that they make about what they're doing or what they care about or their memes will be listed and you can scroll up. He was so insecure that he, and so feeling valueless that he thought people don't need me cluttering up, not their lives or taking up their time, but even just taking up a few square inches on their Facebook feed. You matter just because you're you. How can it matter that I'm me if it doesn't matter who I am? They kind of sense that there's an emptiness here. Behind all this well-meaning talk, there's a cut flower ethic, I think, that comes from Christianity. This idea that God's love is unconditional. We see the stress that people are undergoing and we say, well, God loves you just the way you are. It's well-meaning. but it still doesn't answer the question, who am I? Our greatest need, obviously, we sense that, is in a defining relationship. That's how I began, describing how we're always defined by these relationships. And we come to a point in life where we need to be defined, or we should be defined, by a relationship with God. The idea that God loves us just as we are if our greatest need to be loved is already fulfilled, then why don't need anything else? Why do anything? If God loves us just as we are, why should we bother to try to become better people? In that sense, God loves you just as you are is a counsel of despair. If you're not happy with yourself right now, you never will be. God's already happy with you just the way you are. So what's going on? One thing I notice about Abraham's story is God tells him he has a future for him. God doesn't just love him as he is. He loves him with a plan. He loves him in a way where he says, I have a future for you. Some of the favorite passages in the Bible touch on that very notion. A famous passage from Jeremiah, I know you and the future I have planned for you, plans for good and not for ill. Everyone in transitions in their lives, very often they'll think of that scripture and quote it. It's addressed to the whole of God's people. But clearly, we know that when somebody says God loves you just as you are or, just, or loves you unconditionally, that doesn't cut it. That's coming from a world that wants to hear they're fine just the way they are. But we know there's more to us than that. We don't just have an origin and a meaning. We also have a destiny. And God says, have I got a destiny for you? I don't just love you where you are. I love you with a plan. I love you and I'm taking you somewhere. For that young man who thinks that nobody wants to see him cluttering up their timeline, we can say you're already on God's timeline and have been since before you were born. And you don't need to think about what you can or can't do for God. Because God's already done something for you. 
That's what Jesus was trying to tell Peter. He was about to do something for Peter that Peter couldn't understand. But more than that, the pressure that young people feel, and maybe we feel it ourselves sometimes, to measure up, what are we reaching for? What are we trying to measure up to? For most of us, just because that's the way we're wired, it's to measure up to our parents' expectations. That's good and healthy in children, to have, be responsive to their parents' authority. We're not really trying to measure up to our friends, but we're trying to be responsive to them. We're trying to fit in. We call that socialization, but it's so we don't wind up being sort of crabby loners. And of course, it's very important for many, if not most of us, to find that partner in life, which is uh, what a husband or a wife is meant to be. It's how the Bible describes it. When you think of people describing romantic relationships today and the th ways they argue about it, do you hear them say what they're really meant to be is somebody to find an intimate, close, personal relationship with that person who is meant to be their ally in fulfilling God's purposes in the world? I have yet to run across that in any popular literature or any imagination that somebody might have when they describe their relationships. They're more likely to use quasi-religious language. I'm looking for somebody who can love me for me, somebody who can, in which I can find fulfillment, a safe place. The kind of expectations that will ultimately weigh down another human being and kind of really belong on God. Who am I? I don't know when we started obsessing over that question. I think it was probably when the notion of liberty came around. It used to be that you didn't ask that. You sort of knew who you were in that sense. You were defined by your family, and then you were defined by whatever work your family did. You knew your place in the town where you lived, or the city or the kingdom. But this question of who am I that we ask, I love this, this conflict between Peter because that isn't what Jesus asks at all. Jesus already knows who Peter is, and he's the one that really matters. The question Peter is encouraged to ask himself is, who am I? The question is not us asking ourselves, who am I? But God asking us, who do you say that I am? That's where really a lot of anxieties can be put to rest. Who is God? God is the one who came into the world, gave up everything to give us what we needed. God is the one who forgives. God is the one who gives us wisdom without upbraiding us. God is the, the one who in Christ laid down his life and then took it up again so that we could be made right with God. Who am I? The case of Peter is also illustrative because it begs the question, are we really allowing God to love us with God's plan? Or are we telling God, you don't love me unless you help me with my plan? Peter's got an idea about his future. It's Jesus on the throne, his disciples sort of running things. Maybe, I don't know if Peter wants to be in charge of fishing and, and Galilee but the future he imagines is not Jesus going to a cross. And that's why he can say something that almost just one minute apart that makes no logical sense. He says, you are the Messiah, meaning anointed. You're the king that God is sending, the one who's gonna to be totally in charge. Okay, if he's the king, why are you rebuking him and telling him how it's gonna be just 30 seconds later? At no point did Abraham say, yes, God, thank you. I welcome your suggestions about where and how I might live my life. God said to Abraham, I've got a plan for your life. And Abraham believed God. And that was accounted to him for righteousness. Is there anything that more... If that seems confusing to you, is there anything that, especially if you've had children, that brings a greater pain to your heart or a sense that there's an estrangement where you try to communicate to them that you have their best interests in mind, you give them advice, and you can see that they just don't believe you? If they did, 
they would follow the advice. Oddly enough, this isn't something mysterious. It's something so plain, maybe so simple, that we have difficulty seeing it. We just don't believe sometimes that God actually is loving us with a plan. This is God. We couldn't possibly believe, could we, that God doesn't have the power to bring it about? This is God whose love was shown on the cross. This is, we can't be doubting his intentions. So where then does all the anxiety that so many people feel that they're not measuring up, that they don't matter, that they don't have the right job, that they've wasted their life, where does all this come from? Unless on some level they just don't believe that God is loving them with a plan and that God is taking them somewhere. Part of it may be that Jesus is quite honest about what the plan looks like. He tells them quite openly, he must suffer, go to the cross and be handed over and all that's going to happen. They don't understand yet what it means. But what he's taking them to is not a life that they understood in conventional terms. It's not what they have, what family they were born into, who their friends are, what job they have. He's going to show them a way to love. God is love, John says rather simply in his letters. And we should be loved too. I'm going to lead you not into a land, but into a way of life. I'm not just going to give you love. I'm going to teach you and show you how to live into it. And it may, in fact, he pretty much guarantees his disciples, it will cost you on those conventional terms. At times it may seem like things aren't going well. It's always hard sometimes when people are at a very low point to say God loves you and God has a plan for you. Because especially when somebody's hurting, that's what they want to hear. God is going to make this stuff better. And that's not necessarily the true. It doesn't mean that if you love God and have faith, good things will happen to you. That's certainly a possibility. It means that if you love God and follow God's plan, that you will be blessed. That's not the same thing as happy. It means you're going to know and be, not just know God's love, you're going to have it in you. You're going to be the kind of person that Jesus Christ was. And that's why he has to be very open about this. I'm not guaranteeing you all the things that you've been taught to focus on. Very necessary things. Yes, people taught you how to feed and clothe yourself and get along with your friends and find a partner in life. I'm not talking about that. I'm giving you that thing that you really need more than anything else, the reason why even if you accomplish everything you set out to, be, to do and be, you're still going to have that restlessness. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to take you into a kind of love and a way of life that could cost you everything. And he leads by example. That may be the worst thing that can happen to somebody, I think, is to actually have all their plans come true. To pass all their tests, get the degree they wanted, the job they wanted, the prestige they wanted, to buy the house they wanted and vacation where they wanted, and they're thinking, I'm pretty satisfied. I think I know who I am. I'm all this stuff. Jesus makes the very simple observation that, that life, you're going to lose it. Nobody lives forever. I mean, it's not rocket science. We don't think about it very often, but all that stuff we're going to lose. And even those human relationships that are very important to us, we just lost Billy Graham. He's no longer with us. We can't count on him to go out there and, and seek and save the lost and preach the good news to him. We've suddenly inherited that burden ourselves. And we hope that God will basically pick somebody else to do it other than us. But remember, I suggested that what really defines us is our relationships. When we're defined by that relationship with God, 
even the fear of death and loss begins to go away because Jesus died once and is alive forevermore. And as he pointed out to the Sadducees who thought that death was a state of darkness or extinction, he said, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. When you are defined by your relationship with the eternal, ever-living God, death loses meaning. Loss loses meaning. And when you realize that other people are similarly defined, yes, all we see is that, that grievous hurt that cuts very deeply when we lose somebody because we know that our time with them here is over and we have to get on with the work that we're given to do now without them. But we haven't lost them any more than we would have lost God. It's very hard to give up on those old plans. That's why Peter just couldn't quite get on board. It's why he had so much trouble. And it's particularly why I think it's wonderful that the church preserves the tradition that Peter was eventually crucified upside down. I mean, what a horrible thing. You wouldn't wish that on anybody, and yet, Peter's greatest desire in life was to love Jesus courageously, fully, with everything that was in him. His greatest failure was the day he tried to do it early, even after Jesus said to him, you can't follow me yet, but you'll follow me later. I don't know the details of the last days of Peter's life, but history tells us that he did go where Jesus went. He went there because he loved Christ and he loved the church that God had given him to care for. And I have no doubt that however he went, in whatever manner he went, those who saw it were strengthened. They were given grace and courage to look at a man who could love God with his whole life and to say, that's a God I want to know and I want to be a person who can do that too. In Philippians 3.13, Paul wrote this, looking back at his whole life, whether he had succeeded or failed, and whether we feel that we have succeeded or failed in the things we set out to do, this is good advice. He says, beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. He's talking about the prize in Jesus Christ. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Everything will be all right and better than all right. But you see why just saying that doesn't say nearly enough. To a psychologist recently opined that by just giving that blanket assurance to people in distress, we actually make things worse. It seems that the greatest source of people's anxiety is the uh, inability to confront the obstacles, the worries, the fears that they actually have to deal with in life. And by encouraging them to ignore them or assuring them that they're not there or everything will be all right, it actually causes the anxiety to increase. And that when we, uh, we're actually leading people into to paralyzing fear so the message should always be, a um, um, message of God's love should never be static because God is not a static God. God is a living and a dynamic God. The message is not God loves you right where you are, but God loves you with a plan. The message certainly isn't nothing bad will happen, but the message is that whatever does happen God will lead you through it. Abraham believed it. Peter came to believe it. Now, do we believe it? This is the faith that makes us right with God. This is the faith that Peter talked about, that I talked about two weeks ago. The faith that we have that is just as precious as his own. He said to add a whole bunch of stuff to that. Virtue, knowledge, patience, endurance, godliness, 
brotherly affection, and then finally love. My point that week was that love isn't what you start out with. Love was the goal. Love, that life of love with God was the prize towards which we struggle, the promised land to which we're being led. This is the faith that can calm our fears. This is the faith that can give us courage in the face of obstacles. This is the faith that can give us courage even in the face of death. It's much more precious than any amount of positive thinking. Ultimately, it's more effective than any amount of cognitive behavioral therapy, which in fact does work and should be used when necessary. These are all useful aids. They're crutches to help the wounded walk. But as Christ said to many people, and Peter too once to a man outside the temple, what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Arise, get up, walk. And he didn't just walk. He didn't just exist. He didn't just live. That particular man on that day, if you remember, leapt with joy, giving praise and thanks to God Almighty. I doubt that anything had changed in his life. He'd been a beggar for decades. Really, what life would he have to go back to? Well, all that stuff paled in comparison to the fact that he now knew that he loved, he knew a God who loved him and loved him with a plan and didn't just love him with a plan, but loved him with power. This is the God that we follow. And he's never lied to us and said that the way is going to be easy. He just said that I am going to take you to a place where you can love and you can live like me. You can be like the God who created you. You can find that home you were always looking for, that identity you were always seeking. I know who you are, but that's not what you lack. What you really need to know is not who you are, but as God is asking us today and telling us, what we really need to know is who he is because that's where we find our essential courage and our hope and our strength each and every day of this life. Amen. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward and prepare to receive God's tithe and our offering. Let us pray. From your fullness, O God, we have received grace upon grace. Grant that we will be good stewards of your gifts. May we resist the impulse to live for ourselves instead of for you. May we resist the impulse to live by ourselves instead of with each other. We ask that we might come to believe each and every day in all things and in all places, that you are loving us with a plan. We pray these things and offer these gifts in the name of the one that you sent to save us, Jesus Christ, who will show us a better way. Amen.
invitation is lift high the cross. We'll sing the first three verses, and after the benediction, we'll sing the fourth verse as our response. receive this benediction from the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. Oh.